Okay, I'm reading from my instructions on my latest circuit at, at is.gd forward slash 5 LMDs. So that's is.gd forward slash F I V E L M D S. Or, spelled out, um, independent Samuel dot God demon forward slash Frank independent Victoria Elizabeth. Larry, Mary, <laughs> David, Samuel. Um, and this circuit was done on the 14th of August, or it was updated on the 14th of August, um, at 9 o'clock in the morning, 14 minutes after 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay, so the paragraph I wish to read says, Stop this simulation if, if, it, isn't al if it isn't stopped already and edit all 18 farad capacitors to parametric minimums of 18 farads and parametric maximums of 27 farads. Alternate as you go. So the first capacitor is set to 18 farads minimum parametric and 27 farads maximum parametric. The second capacitor is edited, edited to be the opposite of the first, namely 27 farads minimum parametric and 18 farads maximum parametric and so on until you've edited all 10 capacitors. Ignore the two capacitors to the far right of one farad and one picofarad. So you keep alternating. Every time you alter a capacitor to put in its minimum and min maximum parametric entries, you keep alternating because every time you, cha every time you hit OK on the edit dialog box, the ones you've edited will flip into their opposite state. It's the way the simulator, because the simulator is running, even though you stopped the running of the circuit, you haven't stopped the simulator itself. So you have to alternate your entries in order for them to line up, because they have to be all the same minimums and all the same maximums when you depress the switch. Now the switch is a, um, a snap switch, so if you click it, it'll snap shut and then immediately pop back open again. It might hang shut for a little bit, but that's only because the simulator is hung trying to figure out what you're trying to do while it's trying to run the circuit <coughs> or run the, its own simulation, even if the circuit is, is closed. Well, actually, it, it won't hang if you stop the simulator, but it won't change it. It won't um, synthesize uh, electricity either. So you can only synthesize if the, if the circuit is running and that's when the switch might hang shut but it won't give you any extra energy for hanging shut because the time step on running the circuit will also be frozen it's just that it takes a while for the simulator to figure out what to do uh, let's see what did I now give the lone switch in the upper right a click with your mouse cursor without holding it down now you can hold it down in the beginning if you're impatient and you want to accelerate, but don't do it towards the end because, I mean, unless you feel you have to, and you'll see why. You'll see it. You'll, you'll figure it out. Just snap it once in a while to boost the power gainfully across this entire circuit as measured by the inductor whose oscilloscope tracings are drawn below. Now the inductor is on the far left and the aerial's inputting voltage is on the far right. Now what you'll find is that the gain you can you can put enough energy on the inductor to the far left to far exceed the energy that the aerials are broadcasting to the far right because now they'll be broadcasting because there's more energy in the, at the aerials now that you've boosted the whole circuit than what was there in the beginning when you first started the circuit so instead of the aerials acting as receivers now they're going to act as transmitters and this is where it's going to hurt because the FCC and your local radio people you know running radio uh, radios will get static interference interference a burst every time you flick the switch every time you make a change it's going to put out static interference in your local environment and a big spike it won't last for more than an instant but it'll be very noticeable when somebody's on their radio and the FCC will find you <laughs> and take everything including your toothbrush and they will shut you down permanently so you we have to find some way to alleviate that and that is 
we create a condition in which the aerial either points inward towards itself and not outward towards the environment, such as a hollow sphere. You know, Tesla had a hollow sphere on the top of his Wardenclyffe tower. Well, that might be the only type of aerial that's acceptable, but the problem will still be that we have to heavily insulate the outside of that sphere such that it makes no contact whatsoever with the dielectric of the atmosphere surrounding it. So maybe we have to seal it in a big block of rubber or concrete. Maybe concrete. Concrete would be a semiconductor though. It might be better to be a, a semiconductor rather than a rubber. Now, w it could be rubber if it's carbonized rubber and then it would be semi a semiconductor. So I'm not sure what kind of insulation to place significant depth of insulation to place around these hollow spheres in order for them to work. Um, but initially, they will have a charge on their interior surface, and that interior surface would probably have to be insulated so you don't get any arcing. Um, but the outer surface of the, these hollow spheres would probably have to be encased in some kind of lock either a solid insulator such as rubber or plastic or acrylic or a semiconductor such as carbonized rubber or concrete um, because concrete has some moisture in it so that it makes it a semiconductor um, probably too much of a conductor probably carbonized rubber because then you can regulate how much conductivity by how much microfine carbon powder you have dispersed in that rubber um, it could be microfine carbon dispersed in an acrylic block, an acrylic mixture that you pour in to your mold to make an acrylic block. Um, or the aerials could be insulated flat surface areas um, making contact with the outside air. But broad surface areas, because if we're driving this car and the surrounding air is blowing across these aerials, it may be sufficient to ionize the air and convert the electromagnetic radiation surrounding these aerials into ionized air molecules sufficiently enough so that we don't disturb our local radio environment. Um, it might work. And, the fast, and presumably the faster we drive the car in motion, um, we'll need more power and that'll boost the power at the aerial you know, with spikes every time we change our power setting on, the, on our accelerator pedal. Um, and those spikes have to be alleviated w through ionization. Now if they're negative ions, that's a good thing because it'll take smoke particles out of the air, it'll take chemtrails smoke out of the air, you know, dust particles out of the air, it'll take smog out of the air. I don't know it, what actually these aerials will be positive negative. They won't be one sign value, so they're going to alternate. So half the time there'll be positive ionization and the other half of the time negative and it'll come out even. <laughs> but see, half the time it'll be taking dust particles out of the air, it'll fall to the ground, and the other half of the time it'll be making it harder for the dust particles to fall out of the air. But you will have re taken some of that, some of those dust particles out of the air because they will have been ionized and fall to the ground, presumably. So, um, eventually it'll clear the air in pulses, in alternating pulses of clean and rest and clean and not, not clean and clean and not clean. So if you have enough of these cars driving around, it'll, it should clean the air. Not all at once, but rapidly enough that we won't notice that it's cleaning only half the time. Um, so where was I? This might be Tesla's Pierce era from 1931, question mark. Now, once you've reached several thousands or millions of energy units below your target, presumably around 200 amps and 4 kilovolts, that's unfortunately what the amount of power that comes out of this unit, and so your motor will have to accommodate 4 kilovolts. <laughs> well, actually more because of the surges and spikes. Then stop the simulator and turn off parametric alterations for two pairs of the rightmost capacitors by reverting each of their parametric maximum and minimum entries to the number one while re-entering 18 farads in their uppermost capacitance entry if it isn't already displaying that amount. So there are 10 capacitors and a, a, 
initially from a cold start you parameter you change all of them so that they're parametrically changeable and so that they can um, uh, um, alternate between two different settings of 27 farads and 18 farads but once you get to a value about a million times less than your target by a factor of a million then let's say you're going for amps so if you're down in micro amps then you you turn off parametric alterations for four of the ten capacitors on your far right two pairs closest to the aerial by re-entering because originally they had the number one in their minimum and maximum parametric entry boxes but now you revert it back to the number one and so that'll turn off their susceptibility to being altered but you have to make sure that when you do this that the capacitance entry on the topmost entry box input box of your edit dialog uh, box or window is 18 farads that that's what it'll be set to because half the time it won't be it'll be 27 farads and you have to change it the other half the time it will be 18 farads already and then you don't have to bother changing it um, let's see a real-life build of this simulation would not need to abruptly alter this parameter but instead could gently sweep upwards or downwards attached to the accelerator pedal in an electric car. This is how Tesla may have done it, and then I have a happy face. Um, so he had his accelerator pedal attached to his... You know, see, he set it up, I bet he set it up in his hotel room first. He got the box of his circuitry inside his you know, mysterious wooden box pre... Um, charged up to the, a value less than his target and then he reverted <coughs> a few of his capacitors to their non-variable setting um, while leaving the remaining capacitors variable and he hooked these up to the accelerator pedal in his car and might have been done through, if he used coax cable, it might have been done through the coax, you know, sheath, making a third connection possible, or a fourth, because he's got two heavy cables, so that means two cores, uh, each of those going to, you know, connecting the circuit itself to the motor, and then the two sheaths gives him two additional circuit connections possible. Um, And so maybe he he split his accelerator pedal to be, to connect to each of the two rows of capacitors, one on one side, let's say the top of this circuit simulation, and one on the bottom, so that they would all match up within each row. I don't know. Who knows? Or maybe one is a grounding wire. One sheath is acts as a grounding wire um, to ground the interior of the box. Maybe he had the interior of the wooden box lined with metal, and he had that metal sh lining um, grounded to the chassis of the car, while the other lining, while the other um, sheathing of the other, while the sheathing of the other coax was um, connected to the accelerator pedal and just operated all of the remaining variable uh, capacitors that he wanted to vary. But because the, of the accelerator pedal, you can depress it part way. You don't have to use a switching me me mechanism. You can use a variable capacitor, such as a variac, to sweep from 18 farads upwards to 27 farads in a gradual manner, the ones that are now variable, not the ones that you fixed, and then sweep back downwards when you take your foot off the accelerator pedal, in which case you're just coasting. So you can gently um, increase the energy of your circuit instead of abruptly, which I have to do in my simulator because I don't know how to do it any other way. Um, but this is just, you know, to, uh, proof, uh, basic proof of concept, simple proof of concept to demonstrate the principle involved. Obviously, there's a lot of room for error, or a lot of room for details to fine tune the circuit concept to actually work very well, smoothly and conveniently and user-friendly in the real world. Um, I think that's all I have to say on this update. Um,
You will have watched part one and two already. This is part three that I'm taping at the moment of this particular circuit diagram that um, I developed and have posted now on Vimeo. So these are further instructions on how to operate because I changed the instructions under the circuit. I'm going to have to repost the circuit now with these new instructions. So I got several lines of instructions, something like well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines of instructions. Now, if you hit the circuit um, button, circuit information button in the upper right of the simulator, you'll get more stuff that I haven't talked about in this taping, although I did talk about it in the first one, or was it the second one? I forgot how many tapings I did. Oh, I only did two. Oh, no, oh, no I did in a... I, no, I, yeah, no, I did two already. So this is the third. Yeah, the second one was a short one. No, it was the first one, I think, that I was taught. Well, maybe the second one, too. <laughs> Anywho, so life is good, and um, it's possible to come up with a free energy device that just might be buildable, and might be doable, and might explain Tesla's Pierce Arrow demonstration, you know, and, uh, EV d uh, conversion demonstration of 1931. Because it's, it's quite possible he discovered what Eric Dollard has discovered, because Eric Dollard is the living legend of Tesla uh, incarnate, and it could very well be. Well, my simulation is a DC version because I change it to accommodate, because most cars, EVs these days, have DC motors in them. Uh, mine has two DC motors, so I put a diode at the end to, ch but to change the um, oscillations. He may, it, may have done the same thing because the oscillations have their own characteristic frequency and you don't get to change it. And in an AC motor, that's how you change the speed of your car, is you change the frequency of those AC um, alternations. So he may have put a, di uh, a diode at the very end and then you created, invented, an AC to, uh, excuse me, a DC to AC inverter to invert artificially create um, an AC sine wave out of the DC output and then um, he, he might have had a variable in that DC to AC inverter that would alter the frequency of that conversion from DC to AC so as to run the a to make be able to make the motor variable in speed while making the power supply separately variable. Well, that means then that his accelerator pedal did not was not connected to this power supply, but was instead con connected to well, it was was well, it was connected to the DC to AC inverter, while the power supply was constant in its output. That might be possible for the power level to be um, constant. It's it's po it's possible. You know, anything's possible when you don't know. And I haven't built the thing, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> I wouldn't know how Tesla actually done it. I'm just guessing. So I hope you enjoyed this video of uh, staring at my face talking about this latest circuit design. And catch you later. <laughs>